the runtime and frameworks and everything powering the engine and game to the iPhone. Uh, Elysian Shadows, just real quick, uh, refreshing your memory, was a uh, kickstarted next gen 2D RPG. Basically, we were trying to fuse aspects of 16 bit classical RPGs, like in the Super Nintendo era, with like pixel art, really rudimentary graphics, with like modern dynamic lighting and special effects and things like that. So this is for the entire engine to create that. We're basically we're creating multiple products for our Kickstarter fulfillment. We're creating an engine, a uh, multi-platform SDK and the game itself. Uh, so the approach that we took, like this is really hard for me to get under 10 minutes, so if we talk too long, this will show us up. Um, we wanted to use Qt Creator since we're using it for all of the other platforms we're targeting. Uh, we set up platform-specific Qt project configurations for the iOS device and simulator. Uh, Qt dynamically generates X, the Xcode project, and we're um, sorry, we're using a single application to target the iPhone and iPad. So, this image shows the QT, our QT Creator project. In the corner there, you can see that you can select different devices to build for. It says desktop, iPhone, and iPhone simulator. What I thought was really cool is I personally hate Xcode, and like this completely abstracts you away from it because you can configure in the dot profile uh, build settings for an iPhone or the iOS simulator, and QMake actually dynamically generates the Xcode project for you as part of the build process, so it abstracts all the Xcode stuff away from you. This is our automated build server. It builds all of the devices we are targeting. We just added the iOS device and iOS simulator to it. Completely irrelevant, but it's cool. Yeah, I just wanted to show them off. <laughs> Um, I want to talk a little bit about like what was involved in it. Um, from the uh, inception of the game, it was originally uh, created for the Sega Dreamcast, so we knew it would be uh, need the engine would need to be uh, abstracted away from the hardware. So what we've done is we've created a multi-platform hardware abstraction layer that we call Lib Gyro. It's basically separated into a, a group of different APIs implementing things like uh, audio, video input and different different hardware specific aspects of uh, different things required from a video game. Um, this is implemented as a vanilla C API. There's no C++, no Objective C because this is uh, generally for performance reasons and because it, it's very useful. Especially in this case, we used Objective C on iOS and our engine is C++. So, uh, C served as a bridge for us between the two languages, but we didn't actually have to use Objective C++, so it's kind of, we benefited from being minimalistic. This is just like a real quick screenshot. You can't really see much, but the file structure of the, the, the uh, framework, the library itself, you can see that uh, there's common files. There's, I think that might say iOS. QT specific, x86 specific, basically there's different implementations for every platform. It's uh, link time polymorphic. The Lift Gyro System API manages the general system level initialization and it encapsulates the app delegate, which programmatically creates the new controller in view. It also provides print of style logging functionality, which maps to the NS log internally. It provides exception handling with the classic style signal handler and provides <laughs> um, the video API was uh, kind of a big undertaking. Um, essentially, it encapsulates a GLK view, um, Objective C object. That's just uh, um, an OpenGL oriented uh, view, traditional view, but uh, tailored for OpenGL. Um, Basically, uh, the desktop versions for Mac, Linux, and Windows are all using OpenGL 3.2. So I wanted to keep the code base uniform, so I tried to uh, modify all the 3.2 calls to drop down to OpenGL 3.0, which is what's supported by the, I believe, iPhone 5S and above right now. So uh, everything that I was able to modify to match the 
3.0 subset I did. Uh, there were a few things that weren't implemented that I had to do manually. Uh, there were a few things that had to become uh, preprocessor directives checking for OpenGL ES versus the desktop version. This video API obviously is resolution orientation independent for different variable size devices, different monitor resolutions, uh, rotating landscape portrait, all that stuff. Uh, and then there's some uh, low level iOS specifics regarding frame buffer objects and stuff like that. Uh, the majority of my work was on shader modifications because one of the big selling points of our game is the pretty lighting engine that is a nightmare to get running on other things. Uh, actually runs really well on iOS 6. It runs better than it does on my MacBook. I can't believe it. But uh, it took a lot of work to do that. Um, there's a lot of things that weren't supported in the uh, embedded system version of OpenGL that were in the desktop version. Um, we're using uh, medium precision qualifiers, which means all floating point operations are done with medium precision, whereas on the desktop they're high precision. And actually I bumped it up to high and I didn't even notice a frame rate drop. Uh, there's special samplers on the embedded devices that are just tailored for doing certain things like shadow mapping better than the traditional way for PC. Um, I added feature flags to the fragment shaders to, so you can flag out things like per pixel lighting and, uh, and uh, pixel perfect shadows in case the performance is just too crappy on your uh, iPhone or whatever. Uh, did some loop and rolling, loop unrolling. Try to limit the number of conditionals because that's really a performance killer um, on the GPU with shaders, but I kind of sucked at it because our, our shaders are trying to cram four different lights uh, supporting three different light types per pass, so there was going to be some branching, but I tried to make them branch on uniform values, which just basically keeps it consistent for each uh, batch of vertices, which is faster for it. Uh, and there's some other general optimizations that in the end gave like actually really impressive performance. For the LiveGyro input API, we created an entirely new touch and gesture input mechanism structure. It encapsulates the GLK view controller and maps single finger touches to virtual analog stick. So the position of your finger on the phone is relative to the character and that determines, I mean the position relative to the character determines the direction the character moves. So and we have a pinch of gesture recognition so we can zoom out and zoom in and we have accelerometer input. Probably the pinch gesture thing is just for debugs. We don't want you to zoom out and see the entire level that you're not supposed to see, but for us it's cool. Uh, another API is the uh, abstracted away the map and matrix operations that are really common for uh, graphical and uh, physics operations. Uh, on the iOS device, uh, some of these are implemented using the ARM SIMD, uh, ARM Neon SIMD instructions uh, with inline assembly for hardware optimization. And just to kind of show off because I could, the uh, iOS simulator uses the x86 SSC SIMD instructions. I was mostly just excited that you could do that. We actually uh, have the game running on the simulator, which, believe it or not, is really impressive, like that thing can simulate pretty much everything the device can do as far as the 3D graphics goes, so if you want to buy our game from the device simulator, do that. <laughs> oh, is that mine too? Okay. Uh, this one was really annoying. Initially we didn't plan on having to have a file API, but because of the way uh, files are accessed and bundled together within uh, uh, iOS application bundles, you can't hard code directory paths or anything like that. So we had to have an abstraction layer to where all file accesses are done from this virtual asset uh, root directory. And then underneath the hood, each platform is translating that into an actual path. And on iOS, that's doing some really ugly objective C lookup into an NS bundle so that the application layer doesn't actually care about this one. It shows the ES toolkit integration here. You can select the platform from the drop down menu with the iOS simulator here and the iPhone. And you can then push 
run to send the current level to the device. Android doesn't work, I just added it because it would look really yeah. cool. <laughs> but that's, that's the level editor. That's what it is. So you can play through the level as you create it. If it all works right. And this image shows the iOS simulator integrated with the ES toolkit. The toolkit's in the background. There's a simulator, and this is the end of that log spitting out data. That's, uh, that light is a. Uh, that's casting pixel perfect shadows, and that's a uh, per fragment lit point light, which is basically the most expensive kind of light you can do running. Right? That's kind of cool. And then this is all standard out and uh, standard error output is logged in the NS log, which is then redirected to this console, so you can kind of debug in real time using that. And uh, sorry for the vulgarity here, but that is literally the only picture I have of myself running iPhone. <laughs> We're about to do. Uh, yeah, so that is the, the same invocation. Like there's the uh, uh, NS log uh, being redirected here and then sending the current level. Yeah, so that is The, the point of this tool is to allow you to create uh, levels and play them for the game with uh, scripting, at Lewis scripting in a visual graphical programming environment and targeting like, all the platforms and doing all the cool stuff that our engine is supposed to like to do upon this type of show. Okay, uh, by default you're uh, running the game. The game actually runs in this window and play the game as you build it and stuff like that. Uh, let's see, I can like modify the map while I play, it's kind of cool. But uh, by default, it's your current device, and from here, in theory, I can select the iPhone simulator, and when I do this, let me stop playing it on this device, when I do this, I'm invoking like a bunch of shell scripts, and I am uh, calling some Xcode tools behind the scenes that are trying to send the app to the uh, simulated device. Uh, uh, um. see. Oh, and here it is. It's probably a little Anyway, you can see like I just modified the map there. Uninstalling the previous uh, bundle from the device, hopefully. Doesn't look like it's doing this. Okay. Go on. Waiting for iOS device to be used. I'll have to restart this. This is actually, I promise you, a problem with Xcode in that. Because of the file size of our, our game, I have to recopy it over like so many times. Something gets locked, and even if I were to do this through Xcode, I would still have to restart the device.
Okay, there we go. Now it's copying the device bundle over all the assets, which is really annoying because I have to do that every time. You get the way that Apple bundles things, which is kind of why it's nice to have a simulator. But, uh, you know how to show them the actual icon? And hopefully, it is now going to invoke it. And it did. But I don't really know what to show you. Uh, switch to two on the KVM. Okay. <coughs> and then put it underneath that, that thing right there. Oops. <laughs> the accelerometer input makes you jump, and I don't have it capped right now, so you can jump way too high just by doing this. Need <laughs> <laughs> some brightness. See if you can turn the brightness up on your phone. Yeah. Okay, so this, just moving like this, it's actually, it works like an analog stick on the PlayStation 2. It's taking your, uh, doing some trig and just taking your actual movement there. Supports like reorienting and all that crap. Like I said, <laughs> jump right now is maps the accelerometer and you can jump way, way so higher than you're ever right supposed to be able to jump. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's for that dynamic light is supposed to be attached to yeah, Oh, yeah, that's zoom. Uh, I don't know where the dynamic light is. It's supposed to be on him. I've never tried attaching dynamic light to the main character, Cole. Do you know? Uh, Julian's like totally different from everything else. Hmm, I got ambitions. Anyway, dynamic lighting does work, but uh, I guess I can't attach dynamic light to the character, the main player. We're well, gonna fix that. So, uh, <laughs> any questions? Yeah. You're gonna support the people? Yeah, actually, like we thought about that. Does Apple have an API that lets you do that, or are you kind of on your own? I don't know what is it? Bluetooth controllers? Uh, Bluetooth controllers? Uh, Bluetooth controllers? Uh, you can attach to the Bluetooth API, they have one. I think really? somebody in here actually used it. Okay. Corey? Yeah, yeah well, I, I used to, well, maybe if you want to make sure as far as the controllers you use, are regular Bluetooth, uh, below 4 or not. But okay. th there's an API for both. Honestly, I, I didn't expect it to look or run this well. Like, I, I tried this, like, a couple of years back when I was first starting this engine on the iPhone 4 and it was like horrible but like it's it's incredible how the iPhone 6 is basically able to do everything the desktop PC is able to do with like a little bit of optimization so like we're taking this build a little more seriously than we initially did. A little more seriously than we are doing. Yeah. So, any other questions? So what did you actually program in Swift? It seems like everything is done in Qt versus... Uh, nothing is done in Swift. Everything iOS specific is done in Objective-C because of the uh, performance implications of being statically compiled and because it's way easier for us to interop with C because it's a, a shared subset. Uh, the engine's in C++ and the API is in C, you know, so it's easy for us to abstract it to from each other just using the vanilla C uh, API. So there's actually no switch going on. There's all objectives. Okay. You thought about controlling the character movement with the cell rounder? Yeah, I did think about that. I got one. That would be like, we were thinking about, you, you, you're also going to be able to pick objects up. You can, we just don't have that map. Like, letting you pick it up and throw them yeah, with this kind of deal. We're still not sure. That's new to us. We did we never play with a touch in. What kind of licensing are you going to have for OSMGI? Uh, the engine, we're, we want to do something like Unity where it's like free to use and like do whatever you want unless you sell it for money then you have to give me a little something just so I don't live in the streets while I'm trying to support this thing. <laughs> but that's, that's what we're going to do. Right now it comes with the purchase of the game. You get like the tools and all that. And you'll be able to mod the game, of course, and make your own levels, but in addition to that, like, it's so powerful, hopefully you can make your own game, and it's fully extensible with the Lua scripting language. There's an embedded Lua interpreter running on that right now, actually. Thank you. Hey, Owen, um, you said you use Qt across-platform. Why did you choose Qt over something like Entity 
or Unreal Engine or any other. Uh, actually, device. we're not using Qt for anything on the iOS other than the uh, IDE itself. Qt is being used for the toolkit on the uh, desktop builds, just for UI elements. Everything on the actual devices, and when you download it on Steam, that was all written from scratch without any right work. And I just I wanted to build my own engine, and I had like a vision of how I wanted this game to be with uh, like a merger between 2D and 3D. And I used to work with Unity, and I just didn't see, especially like we started this before Unity 2D, mm -hmm. which is now my greatest nemesis. So before that existed, I saw like a hole in the market, and now that that exists, I see. document your process for any of this, uh, kind of share with the community, or? Uh, I did, I did the paper for this, uh, documents at least the changes and like the general API structure that we use to go from, uh, more or less the desktop builds to the iPhone, like the general things and like the kinds of optimizations, at least for the, the video section and how we integrated it. Any other questions?